Welcome to another episode of Voices in Digital Theology, sponsored by the Global Network for Digital Theology. I'm Katherine Schmidt, Assistant Professor of Theology at Malloy College in New York, and with me is Jonas Kroberg, Deputy Director for the Center for Digital Theology. Hi, Jonas. How are you doing? Hi, all good. Thanks. Good. So today we have um, our dear colleague, uh, Stephen Garner, uh, coming to us from Laidlaw College, <laughs> Uh, in New Zealand, and he is academic dean and senior lecturer in theology. Hi, Stephen. Kia ora, how are you going? All right, so uh, welcome to our little uh, conversation today. We just uh, have been asking people to give us a sense of their academic background generally, and then more specifically, how you got interested in this little world of digital theology that we're all a part of. Great. Well, thank you, and thanks for the opportunity for being able to speak. Um, so originally, uh, when I was much younger, I went to university to study uh, astronomy and chemistry. And along the way, I did a, a bit of computer science. I've always been interested in technology and science and uh, particularly systems and the way things fit together in the world. Um, so um, having sort of got my taster at university for computer science, I um, ended up finishing an undergraduate degree in computer science, then went on and finished uh, a master's degree uh, in computer science with a thesis in the area particularly of software engineering um, and then um, went to work in industry uh, for a while particularly with databases uh, big databases um, and things like that and then um, went back to university to start a doctoral uh, program in computer science and uh, that was in uh, machine learning and looking at applying um, machine learning building inductive um, learning systems that you gave examples of the real world to and it built a model of the real world with big data uh, particularly agricultural data um, and um, about two years into that i realized that i wasn't interested in the maths of the computer science but i was interested in the stories that computer scientists were telling about technology so um, i went up went back and worked in industry for a while and then had the opportunity to come back and uh, sort of have a career change into theology um, so I did my um, doctoral studies uh, in theology, looking at how new emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and virtual reality um, and the philosophy of transhumanism uh, could be engaged with, with Christian understandings of technology through the doctrine and the image of God and then also with a, a Christian social concern uh, element to that as well. You know, the idea that what is actually is appropriate technology and riffing off um, Ian Barber's sort of idea that appropriate technology is technology that is um, economically productive, uh, ecologically sustainable, um, socially just, uh, personally fulfilling, and to which I then added the um, spiritually nourishing to it uh, as well. Um, and so from then, um, I've been um, uh, a lecturer in practical theology at um, the University of Auckland before then, uh, coming through uh, to take up uh, these number of roles at Laidlaw College here in Auckland. Um, and, um, and through all that, um, very much the integrative practical theologian. How do you bring um, theological resources from scripture and tradition and um, wider theological thinking into dialogue with other disciplines, into dialogue with the issues of the day that people are facing around technology? with a view of what's something we can offer that's gospel, good news, into public discourse that people aren't already offering. So that's sort of uh, where I ended up, but certainly this, um, this idea of um, the way in which computer scientists and technologists use mm -hmm. religious language to describe what they're doing, use God language, use mm -hmm. theological language, I, I found that incredibly intriguing. And we're going to get into the transhumanism part specifically and, and some of that language, but before we leave your biography, I just want to see I just want to ask if if you're still doing a lot of that computer science, or I mean, I don't like the maths of it either, <laughs> so I can relate to that part of it. But the rest of it, you know, your expertise in computer science, do you draw on that quite a bit still, or you know, has has theology kind of taken over uh, uh, most of your work? Um, the theological side of things definitely does take, um, I suppose, the priority. Um, but every now and then, I mean, I still read. Um, in that sort of area. Um, I've still got stuff I wrote while I was doing computer science that's being cited uh, regularly and things like that. And um, I'm just really intrigued with, um, you know, what's going on in that sort of area. Every now and then, uh, even as an academic dean, I might be trying to 
do some data analysis, I'll find I'm writing a computer program to do that data analysis. Uh, or, um, and also, I do quite, I've had quite a bit to do over the years with e-learning. So, um, uh, you know, in terms of not only just um, sort of actually teaching in an e-learning, distance learning, hybrid learning context, but actually setting up, uh, configuring, installing uh, systems to do that as well. So still drawing on those computer science skills in, in different ways. Well, your, your college must be very pleased with having someone with those skill sets. Um, and, but you've also been, you know, you've also been one of the pioneers within this field of digital theology. And you're obviously, your, your, your writing has found a number of topics. Uh, the one that we wanted to focus a bit more on today is, is that of eschatology. And um, I was just thinking about what, what, what do you see why is it that eschatology is so central to many discourses about of technology itself? Why mm. is eschatology so central to, to the stories that people tell about technology? I mean, I think in some ways it comes back to, um, to this idea of hope. So I'm particularly interested, obviously, in the Christian understanding of hope. Uh, and it has, you know, uh, sort of a future... Uh, trajectory or telos uh, attached to it um, but hope's an interesting thing because hope lifts your eyes up I guess from looking at your feet in the everyday world as you walk along and gives a whole bunch of different sort of horizons of meaning uh, as well so even if you're incredibly sort of happy uh, and satisfied and all the rest of it um, you still hope for things you still look up and say you know what if um, and certainly also if you're in a, in a particular place of um, where things aren't good, hope can be, provide that thing which sustains you, but also, um, you know, encourages people to challenge and change the status quo, uh, to actually look up and say, this is not how it should be. Um, here's a vision of what it is. I mean, the college I work at at the moment, its vision is um, a world shaped by love, compelled and informed by the gospel. And that then shapes everything that we do in counselling training, teacher education, theology and other things. Uh, what does actually, uh, you know, a hope of a world shaped by love actually look like? How does that create a vision that draws you uh, forward into renewing communities around you, into, uh, you know, helping people get out of bed in the morning because, you know, they've got hope for something. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it could be the, the big theological sort of hope, you know, of, of a Christ's return or abundant life or that kind of stuff. But it could also be the fact that, you know, uh, you're getting up and you're being part of the solution to stuff around the place. Uh, you know, you're contributing out of your own talents, out of your own giftings, uh, in whatever small way you can, uh, to bring hope into the world for those who might not have it. Um, so for me, I find it, it quite a, a unifying thing uh, in my work. And that certainly is one of the places that's um, coming back to that sort of new digital technologies, transhumanist ideologies and things like that, um, you know, even, you know, there's, a, there's these tales of technological hope, you know, this idea that, you know, in a, in a broad sense within transhumanism, you know, we can, through technology, seize control of our own destiny uh, and at one end sort of become like gods. But um, on other hands, it's actually, you know, it goes back almost to Francis's ba Francis Bacon's idea of um, mediating material, um, uh, me mediating, you know, sort of human thinking and rationality in such way as to uh, create sort of, a charitable ends, you know, to improve the human condition uh, in the world around us as well. So, um, you know, but we do have these quite detailed, I suppose you'd say, technological eschatologies that develop, you know, these stories of uh, this is where we're going, this is where we want to get to, this is how we can make the world a better place. Um, in my, um, in, in some recent thinking I've been doing, um, one of those things was going back to look at some of the stories around technological hope that were being told in the 1980s and 1990s around virtual reality. And this idea that on the other side of our computer screens, uh, discrimination would cease because we'd leave our bodies behind um, and we could become, you know, whatever avatar or whatever we wanted to be. Um, and we'd be free from uh, people discriminating on the basis of ethnicity or gender or skin color. And yet, you know, 20 years down the track, we found that actually uh, on the other side of our screens, discrimination exists and it potentially has been amplified by the technology uh, in different ways. So, you know, how does hope speak into that? What's hopeful about uh, the technological world that we're found in, but where we're sort of 
you know, wrapped in media or colonized by technology. Um, you know, what's hopeful in that and how do we provide people uh, a, a sense of hope so they're not overwhelmed by uh, the technological world? So when you, when you encounter um, kind of narratives of eschatology or, you know, eschatological thinking in, in these sort of technological narratives, is your, is your first impulse a kind of, uh, that you sense a continuity between your own, you know, sense of theological eschatology, or is your impulse a kind of like, let's start to make a bunch of distinctions here between what the future looks like from a Christian perspective versus what it looks like from a, from just the kind of, you know, realm of transhumanist, uh, hope. Can you make some distinctions or, or yeah, what's your first, what's your first reaction to those things when you encounter them? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, uh, some of the language I've used is I think in some ways we're all sort of hopeful cyborgs, you know, that the relationship between human and technology is so intertwined and, and to be honest, has been for humanity's uh, duration uh, in different ways. Um, but, you know, my, my initial response is not to say, um, okay, that's, um, you know, all technological narratives of hope or whatever are, are bad. Um, I, I nuance that through, you know, my sort of belief, ultimate belief, you know, that, that the, the eschaton, that the, the, uh, the bringing to fruition of history is ultimately in God's hands and not human hands. But at the same time, uh, we uh, look to the eschaton, we look to the vision of that. And then that provides us, I guess, in the words of, um, I'm just trying to think who that is, uh, Bob Russell. He talks about uh, us looking on the other side of the eschaton at the vision of what it is, and then we become eschatological companions with our technology. We, we look at that and say, oh, there's a vision of uh, suffering being alleviated or hunger being alleviated or right relationships being fulfilled to their fullness and people fulfilling the purpose, you know, to which God had called them to. And this sort of sense of uh, shalom being produced and worked out as well and then that then guides our technological ethics that then guides our use of technology does it align with an eschatological vision that comes out of uh, the, the Christian faith certainly in my particular case and so in some cases some of the narratives of technological uh, hope technological salvation if you want to call it that um, they do have resonances there are places of common ground where you can work with others but there'll be other points where there's, you know, some point of distinct disagreement or uh, something doesn't work um, that way because they've ultimately put their faith in human ability rather than, uh, than in God. And there's sort of a, a nuance there. I mean, even within something like the transhumanist community, there's a huge range of different uh, opinions and they don't all agree with each other. Um, you know, there are those who would look much more for a, a democratic uh, transhumanism or a social democracy type thing. Um, and, you know, they'd be very much looking at uh, how does this serve the community? How does this serve, um, you know, those who are disenfranchised in the technological world? And then you know, the other end, you've probably got these sort of very strong individual libertarians who are all in it for what can I as an individual get out of this uh, as well. And so there'd be those disagreements within that community but it's finding uh, dialogue partners and entering into genuine dialogue that I think is actually important rather than sort of simply saying, oh, we should have nothing to do with this. Well, actually, these ideas are shaping public policy in the real world. These ideas are shaping uh, a number of narratives, whether that's through popular culture or through uh, popular science communications and things like that. How do we then faithfully engage with it? Um, and, you know, certainly, you know, with technology, you know, I, I'm very much of the view that, you know, being made in the image uh, and likeness of God um, means that we are creative co-creators. We're called to a creative agency in the world and representing God in that. And so that certainly aligns not just, you know, with, with, with arts, but also with technology and with science and with the other things that we do. So we need to be uh, actively thinking deeply and faithfully about that and also collaboratively with those around us. So Stephen, um, you've, uh, you've, you've talked about being co-creators. You also talked about uh, terms like cyborgs and transhumanism. And for a lot of people, those seems a bit scary words, <laughs> you know, that, uh, you know, that, 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 that might 
um, challenge or um, somehow distort that Imago Day. So is there, a, is there a limit to the co-creation that you were talking about? Or is that the wrong question to ask altogether? It's, it's not the wrong question to ask, but certainly I always preface it with the created. So we are not God, though we might be called to act into agency um, as part of a divine calling from God's work in the world. Um, I mean, I sort of tend to nuance it, you know, even going back to the Hebrew scriptures, you know, God, uh, you know, bara, creates and can create out of nothing. Humans, asa, we make with what we have. Um, so there's a sort of a potentially a sort of a biblical nuance that comes through uh, there um, as well. The created side of things, we are finite creatures. Uh, and theologically, we'd say, you know, we're ontologically different from God. We're morally separated from God. There's a whole lot of stuff there. And so, um, and certainly my own sort of uh, Presbyterian background is, you know, this idea of um, the doctrine of total depravity, that all aspects of human agency are in some ways affected by uh, ruptured relationships and sin in different ways. So bearing that in mind. Um, so I'm not a, a post-millennialist. We can build heaven on earth. Uh, I'm a little more circumspect about human agency uh, in that area. I mean, the other thing too, of course, is that most of the stories around um, cyborgs and transhumanism things are often coming out of uh, dystopias portrayed in popular culture. So there's the dimension there. But at the same time, you know, we've got fillings in our teeth. We've had laser surgery on our eyes. We take pharmaceuticals to help us with our mental health. Um, you know, we wear clothes. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of things where our technology and our sense of who we are, um, you know, is actually integral to us in different ways. So, I mean, I tend to use cyborg in a sort of a more general sense than, you know, I bolted on an artificial limb in the sense that our technology is often part of us and our environment and actually is the environment in which we, we live and breathe and have our being. And um, it's, um, you know, we can't divorce ourselves from it. The question then is how are we aware of it? How do we, uh, and, and I, certainly in my particular case, I know I find it's a, a double-edged sword. On one hand, there's amazing awe at what we can do and what we have done and and human technological agency and proclivity is just amazing and, and the ability to do that. And on the other hand, there's a shadow side to it, you know, where it's scary. You know, what happens if I've been reduced to a number in a government system or, um, you know, my communications are mediated in a way that, that actually seems to diminish my humanity or, um, you know, there's... Uh, uh, you know, the crises of, of pollution or the environment and things like that produced by uh, ad technology as well. So, you know, it's often, it's often a, a two-edged sword or sometimes even a three or four-edged sword, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real mixture there. I think uh, you referenced this, uh, this earlier, but I think it's worth noting um, that these sort of, uh, this, the eschatological flavor of our narratives of technology have been around for a long time. You know, people had similar things to say about printing press and industrial revolution and all of these things. But like you said, it really, I think, ramped up quite a bit, right, with, with virtual reality and with the digital. So I'm just wondering what you think is, what, what is it about this particular uh, grouping of technology or this particular technological development that really lends itself to that kind of um, eschatological uh, flavor? Hmm. Um, I mean, there's, there's uh, a number of things. I mean, obviously, you know, we can, um, we can see the, the way in which uh, technology can improve the human conditions in, in a number of sort of ways. Um, so um, in terms of, say, uh, sustainable agriculture or um, in terms of uh, health care. But it's always nuanced by the fact that, you know, we know that we have these technological uh, abilities we have you know people will try and sell you a vision of this this better world that you're going to get yet at the same time we could actually you know feed the world quite comfortably with the technological advances we have and it's then a condition of the human heart so uh, as to whether we do that or not um, so I'm actually you know particularly interested in how technological um, hope or technological visions of the future engage with uh, people sort of at the center of their values, I guess you could say, 
that's where I think you know the the potential for change uh, actually is not just getting a new iPhone or not just getting um, you know the, the the latest technological medical advance. Actually, how does technology? How can it be used? How can it be engaged in such a way as to uh, create, I suppose, virtue in the world? You know, faith, hope, and love, or uh, you know, we might talk about courage and justice and temperance and prudence. How can technology? What's the? I guess this is one of the certainly one of the projects I'm working on with some others. What's the? What's the practical wisdom these visions of hope can bring about for living well in the world and loving your neighbour uh, and things like that? So, uh, what's that phrenesis uh, that comes out uh, in there? Um, and so, I think actually that's probably the area of where both technological narratives of salvation and Christian narratives of salvation and, and eschatology and, and hope within the world, um, I think, should be speaking into. You know, what's the practical wisdom for uh, how we ought to live in this context? Uh, I mean, I think probably the biggest sticking point with, certainly with modern digital technologies, um, it continually comes back to how does it change the way we relate to one another um, and some, in some cases it enhances it, you know, because I've, you know, I've looked there and there's you know, religious communities scattered across Asia who can now connect with each other and keep their faith alive uh, in ways through digital technologies that they couldn't because they couldn't travel. Uh, on the other hand, too, then you have issues of, of cyberbullying and discrimination and abuse uh, and of alternate news and facts and things like that as well uh, and the way in which social media uh, functions in some of those contexts. So. Um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, I'm, I'm trying to dig down to what are, what are hopeful values, hopeful virtues that can speak into this world and offer people some concrete practical wisdom for how to live well in it. So you, you talked earlier about uh, kind of having a public role and speaking into pub theologically into the public. So what is it that a Christian uh, version or a Christian hope could particularly offer to this conversation about technology? Um, I mean, one part of what I've, I've done, certainly in my role, I'm not currently doing it at the moment, but I've been on the um, uh, New Zealand Interchurch Bioethics Council. And so that uh, is a mixture of Methodists, Presbyterians and Anglicans, pastors, scientists, doctors, philosophers, theologians. Um, and that particular group has two functions. One is to uh, engage in the public square, uh, and one is to educate those within church communities. Um, so in that sort of engagement in the public square, you know, as part of that when I was on that, we were making public submissions to uh, a range of government organisations who were looking at medical and bioethical technologies. So it could be, you know, around um, the policies that are shaping around the uh, save your siblings. So what happens if you have a child for a tissue match for your other child? Uh, and things like that, or uh, assisted human reproductive technologies or things like that. So how do you speak in a way which is credible and intelligible to those who are making decisions about science and technology? So you're doing good science yourself. You have to be up to the, up to the, you know, up to speed with what's actually going on here. But then how can you say from our faith perspective, this is, uh, these are the things we are concerned about. These are the things we wish to support. Um, and then here's our particular submission around that, which then goes into speaking into that public square. So if you're writing to the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of, of Health or something like that, you're writing in one voice. If you're writing to uh, an ethics committee, you're writing in another voice. And then the educational side of that too is then um, providing resources for, say, the wider church community to understand what these different sorts of medical and bioethical things that are going on uh, in society actually mean. Um, and, uh, you know, it works its way out in, in some interesting, uh, interesting ways. But, you know, it could be uh, around a discussion around euthanasia, but it could also be very much, you know, around genetic modification of organisms or, uh, you know, for crops or for pest control. Uh, or it could be around, um, you know, the use of uh, surrogate uh, human uh, eggs uh, in some sort of in vitro fertilization or, uh, questions around what do you do with uh, embryos that are formed during uh, IVF and things like that. Um, and also, also very much a pastoral concern speaking to that, because often it's all about the science and people always pitch it sort of, you know, it's, it's for or against doing whatever like this. But actually, a lot of what you do in that role is also advocate for pastoral care in a variety of ways for the people who are involved in this 
uh, very you know stressful, traumatic medical, bioethical sort of areas too. How do you uh, how do you make sure that there's appropriate counselling support? How do you make sure that they have space to uh, engage constructively in what they're doing and to think deeply about it and be supported in that, rather than simply being offered a black and white choice? Uh, you know, and and here you go, and and also the ongoing ramifications for that as well. You know, so what are the ongoing ramifications for a child who's been created as a tissue match for their um, for their sibling or something like that? You know, what does that mean to them? Uh, are they simply uh, a means to an end, or are they an end in themselves uh, as well? So engaging with those kinds of things. So how do you speak hopefully into that? How do you say actually no? Uh, we have a vision of a better future. We have a vision in which you are an end um, it, rather than a means. Um, and to speak into that, does that clarify things a bit, Jonas? Sure. That's a range of topics. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I, I'm going to give you the last word here, Stephen. And it has to do with, with academic theology. But I feel like at this point, like now all I'm thinking about is like tissue matches and things like <laughs> that. <laughs> things like that but um yeah so we, we one of the another thing that we've been asking uh, quite a few of our guests is to uh give us kind of some some meta commentary on on you know this this kind of burgeoning field of digital theology and you know how it relates to more traditional academic subdisciplines in theology or sort of the whole guild you know the guild as a whole so do you have any thoughts about this what do you, what do you think about the relationship of digital theology and and the rest of theology yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting space. I mean, you can, you can come at this from different points of view. You can simply say, oh, we're doing theology in a digital context, or you might say, well, actually, how is digital technology changing how we think theologically uh, about certain things? Um, I mean, I think, I think it's, the more I think about it and the more I work in this field, the more different areas of theology I find that intersect with it. I mean, typically people would, might have limited this to uh, theological ethics in a lot of ways and ethical behavior within digital spaces um, and things like that and also um, you know doctrine of humanity um, what does it mean to be human in a technological world or to create things like that I actually think it's far broader than that I, which is why I've picked hope as my theme to try and link things together because you know uh, if you look for hope across the breadth of Christian theology it crops up everywhere so that's sort of one of the reasons I'm using hope. I mean, the other thing too, of course, you know, with academic or traditional academic theology um, in sort of in a classical sense is um, that it's often limited to certain parts of the world or certain communities uh, and their voices tend to, to dominate. So Western Europe, uh, the UK, the US uh, in certain ways. Um, and I'm particularly interested because I also work in the area of contextual theology um, I'm interested in how different voices might speak into that. How might different uh, cultural understandings of uh, Christianity and personhood and community and what values are important uh, speak back into this wider discourse? Because one of the things about digital technologies and things like that is that they do, you know, bring uh, a global village together. But um, I'd be particularly uncomfortable with a global village that only spoke with the voice of uh, a particular sector of the globe. Um, so that's why I'm, I work with my own students here, you know, uh, Pacific Island students, Maori students, uh, and I'm Asian students, and, and those who are sort of just within the context of Aotearoa New Zealand, to try and think about these things. Because we have subtle differences and nuances and things that we can add to the conversation in the same way that each of you in your own context brings things uh, to the conversation. So very much an integrative uh, theology and uh, dialogue. Yeah, and I know that all three of us really do mean the global aspect of our global network for digital theology. So I guess at this point, we should also say for anybody that's watching this, <laughs> who wants to be a part of the conversation and feels like they aren't or know somebody that, that should be, please let us know. We're always, you know, we're always open for um, including as many people as possible. So, uh, Stephen, thank you so much for taking time with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much.